This is Nana. Hi, I'm Nana. Nana is 95 years old, which means she lived through this. This. One, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. That's one small step for man. This and this. Time for the great debate, all right? This one has everyone asking, what color is this dress? Tamron, get us gold. to the bottom of this. Yes, it is dividing people into two very distinct camps. White and gold versus blue and black, and the issue is taking on really a life of its own. I sat down with Betty C. Smith, or Nana, to talk about the greatest event in her lifetime, World War II. Do you remember where you were the first time you heard about World War II? Yes. And where were you? I was at home, at my parents' home. But I was only 12 years old when I heard about it. That was when Hitler wanted to take over Poland. And we were getting a newspaper, which was unusual out in the country. But I knew a little bit about what was in the newspaper every day. And he was trying to take over Poland. So then I dismissed it. Twelve years old, you didn't, you didn't dwell on things like that too much. And then in December, this was in 1939. So in December of 1941, I was helping warm up supper from, it was Sunday, and Grandma Roback was there with us, and she was going to go to church with us. So the brothers had gone to milk the cows, because that had to be done. And we had a radio, which was on a battery, operated. And they came on the radio at the Old Fashioned Revival Hour. I remember the name of the program. It was, and Grandma liked to listen to that. And so we turned on the radio for the Old Fashioned Revival Hour and heard President Roosevelt say, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate, of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. And it was just, I, I can't even tell you how I felt, how our whole family felt. And we did go on to church and everybody was real quiet and had heard the same thing if they hadn't heard why we told each other, you know. We're at war. Just everybody knew that we were at war. And it was just a sad time for the country. You just wanted to be patriotic and you didn't know what to do. America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. Yes, people, were, people were going, leaving for the Army. They were being drafted because there was a, a draft board and people were lined up num numerically. I don't know how they, you were 1A meant you were going, you were on your way. Right. And uh, if you went in and were, were um, 
interviewed or examined in any way. If you had flat feet, you didn't make it. You could go back home. But that was something that you almost hoped that you'd had that our friends or family would have flat feet because they lived with it. You know, it wasn't anything terminal. Right. And uh, so, but people were leaving and uh, on the trains and buses. And right. I knew people who had gone to the Army, and that was our biggest worry because I had two brothers living at home, and they were the right age to go to the Army. One in the Army, no, both in the Navy. But the oldest one never did. He had uh, basic training, but then he went with, there was a um, band leader called Fred Waring and his musicians that went to the Army bases to entertain the troops. And he tried out people who could sing because he had a choir that traveled with him. And Alan made it to the choir and traveled with Fred Waring's orchestra. Um, and then when that was over, he, he had a certain length of time, I don't know how long. Then he was uh, back in the Navy again, and uh, I could tell you a lot more about that. Bob went into the Army, and just the plain Army, and uh, the worst Christmas we ever had was everybody was home except Bob. And uh, we were opening gifts, and there was somebody walking down the road, and it's where they live, where Lanny lives now. And the person was Bob. He had hitchhiked from Mississippi to California and got out at the road that led to my folks' place, and he was coming home for Christmas. And that made Christmas okay. I don't remember that. You just watched to see who, who had been killed because everybody in town knew it. It came out in the newspapers. Um, I don't remember the feelings. I had a cousin, Carl, um, that, I, that we knew did not come back. And we waited a while before my aunt, his mother, heard about uh, that he was missing in action. And uh, to make a long story short, he was, uh, I thought, in Pearl Harbor. We thought for a long time that he was killed at Pearl Harbor. But he was in New Caledonia, which is a little island close to Pearl Harbor. And when we got around to the war being over and knowing uh, just where he was. His body was shipped back to the parents, and he is buried at Jefferson City at the National Cemetery now. I've been to the grave. I went to the fu funeral when they shipped his body back, and then not too, about a year ago, I went to the grave and just to see where he was, whether it was what it was like, and it was just all the stones were the same like it is at Arlington, you know. And so uh, I wrote letters to him and they all came back. I wrote letters to my uncle who was um, in the Army, and that was the whole thing at home. Write letters to your friends and relatives and keep them from being lonesome. And I wrote a lot of letters. I remember where I was when I heard that the war was over. I was in Kansas City working at the Army U.S. Army Quartermaster Corps. And I was living with, my roommate was a girl named Fern, and she had a TV, and that was unusual to have TVs at that time. And President Roosevelt came on the TV and said the war had ended, Japan had given up. And I don't know, my, my memory is a little foggy as about where I was. But I know that while I was in school at Warrensburg, that they dismissed classes. So I don't know whether that overlapped with me knowing about the war being over. But anyway, they dismissed classes and said, everybody go home, no more classes. 
And when I got to California, Missouri, I had a pass to ride the train free of charge because my dad worked for Missouri Pacific. And um, when I got to California, they had burned a tree out in the depot area where the train would stop and let people off. And it was just a huge, huge bonfire at the Commons. It's called, it was called later called the Commons but it was where the, the downtown area was. And the railroad track went through there, and so I got off the train and mingled among all the people. I knew most of them, of course. And uh, that was the end of the war. Everybody was celebrating. And in their own way. I think, I think you have to have things happen sometimes to appreciate them. And, um, you know, my dad went to work on the railroad about the time the war started. And uh, people didn't have jobs. It was after the Depression, which was before the war, 1929. So there were things happen that you just chalk it up. I don't know that you ever really accept it, but you, nowadays I would say, thank you, Lord, for the things, good things that have happened. And, and maybe then I wasn't mature enough to think that.